who has access to what? If you are looking for identity and access management talk, you have come to the right place. This is the Identity at the Center podcast. Hosts Jeff Stedman and Jim McDonald are strategic advisors with Identropies Advisory Services Practice and are here to talk about a wide range of identity and access management topics. Comments, questions, and accolades can all be sent to identity at the center.com. And now, on to the show. All right. Well, welcome to episode six, Black Hat Edition. Um, I'm on site here at the Black Hat Conference in Las Vegas. We've also got Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Good, good. Enjoying that tinfoil hat. hat. <laughs> Again? Wearing my tinfoil hat, have all my electronics uh, properly wrapped to make sure there's no breaches. But paranoia, on, the paranoia radar on full. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, they put signs all over Black Hat that's, like, basically saying, hey, you know what, this is meant to be a conference for everybody. Please don't hack other people. And, um, you know, there's I'm sure there are people who are already doing it. Black Hat has turned more into, like, a corporate event. And then you right. have DEFCON, which is essentially the next couple of days after this, um, that is, you know, kind of more of the tech, deeper dive technical type things. But um, the hardcore hackers, like we talked about last week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so we have a little bit of a Black Hat edition that we're going to talk about today. Some of the things that I thought were pretty interesting that I saw here um, at the conference, a couple of uh, Maybe not necessarily specific to identity and access management, although we might try to loosely tie it, but that I thought were interesting just from a general security perspective. Um, the first thing I guess I'll talk about here is we had a keynote speak uh, speaker from Square uh, that was really good. And um, you know, one of the things that he pointed out was that cybersecurity already has plenty of attention and it's no longer an afterthought. And you know, I think to some degree that's true. There may be some components of cybersecurity that are not um, as much, you know, less afterthought status than others, um, just based on, you know, some of the clients that, that Jim, you and I have worked with, you know, there's always something that needs to be improved. But I think, and let me know if you agree with this, is that cybersecurity as a whole, people kind of get it now, or at least they're starting to get it and understand the need for it. Would that be fair to say? I think it's a continuum. I think, you know, financial organizations and and I'd say most corporations get it to some degree, but you know, we've run into clients uh, where they say we make, and I'll just say widgets, uh, because if I get into specific products, you might know who I'm talking <laughs> about, but they, um, they say we make widgets, we don't do security, or we don't make computers, or we're not a bank, and I don't think they get it, because if they're a brand, if they're out in the open, uh, they are targets, they have data, if, if somehow they can be exploited for money, which almost every organization can, especially when you think about uh, some of the ways that organizations get hacked and held for ransom these days, they're all targets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's why I think some companies are, are a lot better or pay more focus on specific areas. You know, network security versus maybe identity, right? Those sorts of things. Or... Um, you know, physical security versus logical security. Um, that's kind of what I was thinking from a, you know, some some folks are getting it, but at the uh, at a highest level, that's why I think just, you know, cybersecurity, and I kind of agree with that statement is that there's definitely gaps that are still out there and uh, that need to be worked on. I think there's also, there's so there's companies, I'd say overall companies are getting it more and more, but companies are made up of people. Some yep. people get it. Some people still don't get it. And I think in industries where they've been the center of attack after attack, almost everyone there gets it. And in industries where it has been an afterthought for so long, there's still a majority of people who don't get it. And that's where you see uh, chief information security officers and people who are responsible for IM and cybersecurity as a whole pushing the boulder uphill. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, I guess we want to focus on today cybersecurity and, and uh, doing things the right way. And, you know, attitudes are going to change over time. It's not going to be a light switch. 
Yeah, I think it's it's a mindset, right? If you're if you're open to new things, if I'm a CISO and I'm looking at what's next, right? These are the type of things that I'm going to be looking for. Uh, is it's it's a continual battle, right? To try and secure all the things. Um, but if you get into this kind of yeah, we're fine, you know, don't need to worry about it mindset. I think that's where there's definitely some risk. You got you have to be continually evolving your your posture. So Jeff, one of the things I love about conferences, the you know, getting into the exhibit hall and seeing all the new vendors and and um, you know the problems that they're trying to solve, and then attending sessions. So what are some of the the best ones that you've run into and you saw? So the best one I saw is one around deep fakes. And I kind of want to save that one for the end because I think that one's going to open up pretty good conversation. It's something that I've been looking at uh, for the last, I don't know, few months at least, if not before that, just from a curiosity perspective. But um, maybe we'll talk about that one last. Um, before that, uh, there was... There was a, uh, a session on worshiping, and this is a new term that I had not really heard of before. Have you heard of worshiping? Not before today. Okay. So essentially, it is a Trojan horse attack that takes place as a bridge between the physical world and the networked world. That sounds very convoluted, so let me explain that. Uh, so basically, the way it works is... You put together a real cheap network device with cellular connectivity, something like a 3G connection doesn't need to be anything fancy, typically something that is, you know, 100 bucks or less. You drop it into a box or an envelope or something, and it's typically around the size of a smaller cell phone, and you ship it to whoever your target is, right? If you're a company, et cetera, it goes into the mailroom, probably a bigger company, or maybe it sits on someone's desk if they're a smaller company. And this little device is basically looking for um, wireless, uh, wireless networks to connect to. And then because it has a, uh, 3G connection or, you know, some sort of cellular connection, uh, whoever is operating the device can sniff those packets and attempt to run exploits or cracks against the wireless network from a remote position. So they don't actually have to be sitting in your parking lot anymore. Um, you know, doing that, they can basically ship you a thing and this was presented, I believe it was by IBM um, X-Force, I think it was, X-Force Red, um, that kind of proved this out. But basically, it's a Trojan horse and the fact that, hey, we're this thing that looks benign, it's a package. You know, how many times are packages really closely inspected in, in a company um, and sits on someone's desk just looking for, you know, Wi-Fi networks to connect to. And once you're able to exploit the network, you're inside the firewall, typically. You're inside the physical perimeter. And you can start, you know, looking for data, et cetera, which I thought was, you know, it's a cheap way to get access. <laughs> yeah. Um, do it anywhere in the world. Pretty amazing. And the other thing is that there are so many network connected devices these days, things like network printers that put off their own wireless network. And, you know, they they can serve as if they are hacked you know, they're not designed to do it, but if they're hacked, they could end up as a bridge into the network. And yeah. all this, Sorry, go ahead. No, all a hacker would need is, you know, a bridge long enough to go ahead and create some accounts or to run a few scripts and, and find some exploits and get some some software installed and living on the network. Yep. You're, you're in and you're basically moving laterally and up uh, as you find opportunities to do so. So, yeah, I mean, you start with a, you know, start with a printer. Then you move over to the, um, you know, coffee maker, which sits on the, on the Wi-Fi, and uh, IoT security is something that's come up, you know, quite a bit recently. I think uh, there's been some reports, of, and I don't know, I don't know if the details around this to talk intelligently, but I recall seeing recently some reports around um, IoT devices uh, becoming a target uh, for different attacks, which isn't new, but seems to be like there was some sort of recent uh, uh, work around that. And probably yeah. for our audience, Jeff, I mean. Our audience probably includes um, people who would be responsible for more generally securing the network and highlighting this as as a, an attack vector is important. You know, I hadn't heard of worshipping. When I heard of it, it reminded me of war dialing, which was popular, you know, 20 years ago where people would set up modems and it would just sequentially dial phone numbers looking for other modems and then try to connect to the modem and see if they could get onto the network, see if they could get um, 
some kind of login prompt or something like that and hope that they could gateway into somebody's network. Right. Um, remember I worked at a corporation. I probably am a little ashamed to admit this, but at the time our, you know, our administrative group had a couple of modems in our small data center that connected back that we could use to connect to the network in case everything was down. If the routers went down, we could go ahead and, and do work at night. Um, now, that's not the case these days. I mean, any good network team is going to go ahead and shut those suckers down. But I saw um, a presentation. I, I wish I could attribute it to whoever came up with this. But they were saying that what they do is they were kind of ethical hackers. So probably a lot of people that are at the, uh, at the Black Hat conference, but these are more white hat type people. And... They would go, <laughs> yeah, what, yeah, exactly. And they would um, basically sell into information security departments that we we know we can get into your network. And they you know they put that challenge down, and most of the folks would say, "Well, no, you can't." Well, two of the methods that I heard that it were similar to this war shipping was one: they could take a um, a drone and fly it up onto the ceiling of a building with you know, with a Wi-Fi connection, probably a cell phone, and just look for IoT devices like printers. Yep. The other was they would go to uh, the front desk and say, you know, I, I'm here for a meeting, but I really just want to go to the bathroom. And most people are going to say, go ahead, go to the bathroom. Well, now you're in the building, you're behind the security desk. Mm -hmm. And so, look, I'm not saying that's going to work at every place, but I bet you most places the drone idea could work if you executed the uh, the attack properly. Yeah, they basically use a wi uh, a Wi-Fi pineapple to act as a um, fake AP access point for the network and try to get people to connect to it. It's kind of a like a man in the middle attack. Um, you know, one of my friends, Mark, um, I believe he has some experience with this, and I'd love to have him on at some point as a guest to to talk about that. Because I think I'm pretty sure that he did that for one of the companies that I worked at in the past to show some of the exploits that were available. So I hopefully I'm not out of turn there. But um, Mark, if you're listening, we, we definitely want to have you on. Let's talk about that. <laughs> well, Mark, join the podcast. That's the name. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So that was warshipping. Um, and this this other topic that I would bring up here isn't wasn't necessarily at Black Hat, but something I saw actually on my way out to Black Hat, and that's. Uh, around common access cards or CAC cards that the U.S. military uses. Um, they're looking at replacing that with a wearable identity token in the future. So the way this would work is you would have this sort of wearable that you know someone in the military would wear that would, in conjunction with a PIN that the person would type in, would give them access to you know, whatever device that they're looking at um, in the field or, you know, potentially in the office, those sorts of things. So I thought it was interesting just from a, you know, uh, modernization approach, you know, CAC cards have been around since 2001. So probably due for an upgrade at this point, you know, 20 years later, roughly by the time I'm sure the identity tokens get out there. But can you imagine, you know, soldiers now wearing part of their multi-factor uh, outfit, <laughs> um, walking up to a, you know, a terminal or a laptop or something, potentially even the field, and I'll have a, you know, they'll, they'll have that, they'll type in a pin, and then I'll give them access to what they're doing. Um, certainly interesting, probably solves some of the physical things that could go wrong with a, a card reader um, in the field, if it gets damaged, et cetera. I mean, the same thing could probably happen with a wearable, um, but introduces, you know, maybe new ways that there could be potential attacks on a wearable in the, in the field. Right, a wearable, yeah, definitely attacks. The thing that was coming to my mind also was, what about the use of biometrics? I mean, it would seem to me that facial recognition or a fingerprint would be a, another way to go about this. Obviously, you need to be able to connect back to some kind of service uh, that might be more difficult or more unrealistic in, in kind of the war environment. Yeah, I can imagine things like, you know, fingerprints might not be the best way if there's, you know, in the field and things that might be happening there. So I don't know if that's the right answer or not. I mean, there's probably a combination of things that could be done. But, you know, the first thing I think of is when you're wearing a wearable is I think of my Apple Watch and my MacBook, right? I can walk up to the device and it authenticates me because it sees my Apple Watch as an approved device. 
and you know it unlocks my PC. I think the same kind of concept plus a pin is what they're looking at on the military side. Um, but in my mind, it also opens up that opportunity for you know what some sort of denial of service attack, which you and I were talking about um, you know before we we hopped on this call here. Right, um, could be something to think about too. Yeah, denial of service. Um, but I guess the idea with the wearable is that it would be multifunction, right? So it wouldn't just be something to as a form of authentication, but because otherwise, what's the great improvement over the cat card, right? If it's just a, a way to prove that, hey, I have something. So if you think about multi-factor authentication, it's something I know, something I have, or something I am. Um, so if it's something I have, I would think a wearable or a cat card, either one would be that kind of form of identification. Uh, if it's if it's a wearable, you know, if it's like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or something, <laughs> there's more that you can get from that device than just the identity ver- identity verification. Right. Yeah, I think it's probably just the use case around you know, how do you make it easier. I think yeah, you know, I think the the intention is they go for like a proximity based authentication in addition to something that you have to take out, slide into a device, you know, hope that physical connection isn't filled with, you know, dirt, grime, whatever might be out, out there, um, right. and try to remove points of failure from a physical component. And really, it, if you think about it, it's, a, it's very much like uh, phones these days no longer having physical buttons on them or trying to remove as many physical buttons on them. So, you know, iPhones no longer have a home button. They say it's, you know, part of it is to improve the screen size, but it's also one part that would typically fail on a device because it's getting used over and over again. So if you can remove switches and physical components, you reduce, you know, error rates or fail, failure rates, I should say. It's true. Um, how many times have you and I talked about the iPhone 10 though, and not having a home button? I, I refuse to upgrade to the new phone because I don't want to give up the home button, even though I will say that the, the thumbprint scan is kind of hit or miss. If your thumb is even slightly wet, it usually won't pick it up, but I do like the ability to push that button. Mm-hmm. I am torn on it. I think the technology works fine. I have, you know, the iPhone and it has the face ID and it works okay. Um, I typically don't have any problems with it. What I miss, and this is going to sound really stupid and not dangerous, so kids don't drive us at home, is in the car. To, to unlock your phone, you have to look at it. Whereas if you have the fingerprint, right, you can just touch it and it's unlocked. So right. I find that really irritating at first. Uh, you know, it's I've gotten used to it at this point. And, you know, technically it is illegal uh, in some states, mine included, to even have a phone in your hand now at this point while you're driving. That's right. Um, usability factor for me, I still prefer the touch, you know, the, the, the fingerprint approach versus the look, you know, the looking at it approach. Um, and I'm sure we'll see that come back. Samsung has already introduced ultrasonic, you know, uh, thumbprint readers that are underneath the screens. They don't work as quickly as, you know, a physical component that is on top of the screen. And now we're really starting to get away from from IAM, uh, but uh, you know I'm definitely a, a mobile device nerd. But I think you'll see the comeback of under screen thumbprint or fingerprint readers um, continue to get better, and that'll be sort of the the next thing that's coming out in the next few years. Yeah. So deep all right, deep 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 you have us on the edge of our seats, Jeff. <laughs> I'm what sure. I'm sure you're sitting there and you're like, "Oh my gosh, what is a deep fake? What is um, a deep fake?" So a deep fake has a variety of different things, but it boils down to some level of impersonation, impersonization around faking video or faking audio to make it look like someone is saying something um, that they did not actually say. One of them, it's been around for a couple of years um, and it's something that has grown up quite a bit just in these last roughly three years or so since it was since it was first kind of brought out. And some of the more famous ones that you might have seen out there or maybe not seen or known about is, you know, there was one with uh, uh, President Obama saying something and then someone basically synthesized audio over that to make it look like he was saying something else. Same, right. you know, mouth gestures, et cetera, but the audio had been tailored for him to say something he didn't completely say. And this has come up quite a bit. Uh, and I think is something that we really need to be on guard for in the future is how do you how do you validate that what you're looking at 
is in fact real because the deep fakes, as they're called, have gotten so much better than they have in the past because there's been tools that have been developed, you know, specifically for this um, that have been that have been leveraged to make it appear as if people are saying things that they haven't really. Um, so it's yeah. definitely scary to think about how it could be used to, you know, influence public sentiment. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. And you think about it right now, it's probably, probably you know, the, the general public is probably not super concerned because the technology and effort required to to do this is is the challenge right now. But, you know, 20 years down the road, if it's software that, you know, it's consumerized and you can just take a funny video of somebody from YouTube and then you can dub your own words. And I mean, then it's going to be a real something people really get concerned about. Yeah. So so you're saying 20 years from now, um, the technology is already here. I can do this on my you do this on your laptop. <laughs> the tools that have been recently written around making this easier um, exist today and can be done in a relatively quick time frame. Um, the way that it typically works is all you need is source video. So you're gonna basically think about it from this kind of logical step. You've got video A, which is the target of the person that you want to impersonate. And then you've got video B, which is video of what you want that person today. It could be you, it could be me, you know, and video A could be uh, Fletcher, let's say, for example, right? We want to make Fletcher say something else. All we do is we start to find, <laughs> yeah, we start to find <laughs> images or video um, that exist already uh, of Fletcher saying different things. We feed that into an AI model. We take video that we put together to say, here's what I want that person to say, feed those together, extract out the components um, that we would use. So in this case, we want to use Fletcher's everything about Fletcher, his face, everything he's at, but we want to superimpose our mouth on top of the on top of Fletcher and try to make it as, look as realistic as possible. The tools already exist to do that essentially in an automated format. Um, all you have to do is feed it the source information and then um, you know export it out into the final video where you would see a video of Fletcher saying something like, I like puppies, you know, or something like that. When when we all know Fletcher doesn't like puppies. He's a mon he's a total monster. He's the only one. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, but I'm wondering if I could see the uh wow, I mean you could see all kinds of nefarious uses for that kind of technology. So does it require some kind of supercomputer or I mean you were there at the session, were they doing yeah. it on pretty much um standard equipment? Standard equipment. The only thing a supercomputer, and when I say supercomputer, just anything that's powerful, is speed up the time it takes to perform the machine learning and the AI components of it, and then to render and compile a video. It's really no different than trying to, you know, produce a video, for example, on a lap on a laptop versus a desktop. If you have a good video card or something like that, you know, the, the, the extra processing power definitely plays into a fact. But the actual code can technically run on just about, you know, any type of modern hardware, whether it's, you know, your, your basic business laptop, or if you've got something a little higher end, obviously make it go quicker. And these tools are free. I mean, they're out on GitHub. Um, you know, they're, they're continually being improved. Uh, and it, it is, it is a very, very slippery slope. I, yeah. you know, I'm interested in it because I think just from a, uh, a fun factor, right? We certainly like our memes on the inside at Identropy, <laughs> you know, being able to put together videos of, you know, people doing dumb stuff internally is probably one thing or doing with friends. But when you start to leverage it for the nefarious things, financial gain and election influencing, um, you know, political, military, whatever it may be, um, certainly opens up that very slippery slope of, okay, how do we guard ourselves against that. And that was really kind of the point of the session that I went that I was at was, okay, deep fakes are here. They're not going to go away. I mean, the technology is already out there um, and people can do it. So how do you detect when someone, when there's a video that has been deep faked or an audio, um, those sorts of things. And there's a few different ways that you can look at it. Um, the, uh, the way that you would probably approach it would be a few different signals 
um, or different detection methodologies. The first one might be at the signal level. So things like the noise on the sensor might be different for, well, let's, focus, let's, let's take a, an example, right? Let's say in that example, right, we took my mouth and we put it over Fletcher's video so that it's Fletcher in the video except for my mouth. The, sig the sensor noise between the video associated with my mouth and Fletcher's rest of the component of the image might be different. So there might be different interpolations, et cetera. There could be different types of compressions that's being used at the JPEG level. A lot of very technical kind of things, and I don't want to get too deep into that. But that's one level you can look at is at the signal level. Um, another one that might make more sense is at the physical level, which is around the lighting conditions. So if you think about a video, right, and, and you've got the subject who is the target of who we're trying to impersonate, and maybe they had a light and it's shining on them from the left and creating shadows, right, that go across the right because of the way the light works. If you don't rehab that exact same lighting, the lighting might look different around different areas of the video. So maybe, you know, the mouth or et cetera might have different lighting compared to the rest of the picture. Um, something that, you know, if someone's paying a lot of attention could obviously fake as well. And yeah, I think the other thing. thing is, I think the things you're bringing up are, you know, as the quality gets better and better, mm -hmm. the expert to detect. So if I was interrogating you, right, and I'm trying to get you to admit to a crime, and then I show you a video of your buddy in the other room who just said that Jeff did it. Yeah. You know, you're not going to be like, oh, I, look, the lighting is <laughs> different in this. It's not, like, it has to be, no, I mean, that's, I, I think that's a big concern is technology like this, like um, cloning, you know, DNA cloning and, and be, you know, we, what do we, uh, we DNA cloned a sheep mm -hmm. Golly. 20 years ago. Yeah, Can't like tell you, but yeah. yeah. It's probably not that far into the future if it hasn't already happened of cloning a human being. So the technology is moving so fast and society's going to have to deal with these types of technological advances. And are we ready for it or not? <laughs> right. That's the question. Well, I think that's the, that's the frontier that I think a lot of companies are starting to figure out is how do you detect these? I know Adobe has uh, something that they've started to, to work on and maybe even released. Uh, the session that I was at was sponsored by Zero Fox. Uh, they, they have you know, skin in the game um, around social impersonation and so forth. Um, and they think, and I believe they're going to be releasing later this week the tool that they use to try to detect a deep fake. And it focuses on, on specifically the mouth region of videos um, to try and detect some of the, th the things that might be indicators of, you know, a fake video versus a real video. Um, but you know, as the as the offense gets more complicated, the defense, meaning you know, how do you check to make sure it's real or not, is going to have to evolve as well. To try and keep right. it. but it was it was very interesting it's definitely worth um you know looking at more if you're interested in that sort of things because i think it has really huge um ramifications for um not you know not just security but kind of society as a whole and can you believe your eyes um anymore or not and where are you getting your your data and your your information from because you know that could also play into it yeah great topics and and i think the overall you know, if I was to ask a question, why would somebody in your position in identity and access management go to the Black Hat conference? I'm going to suppose that part of it's just awareness and getting you to think about these kind of topics. And it maybe isn't directly uh, part of kind of what you do, you know, like an IAM conference would be, but it opens your eyes to a lot of things. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, I, I like coming to Black Hat specifically because this is typically where the exploits and the things that come out of this conference and also, um, you know, uh, uh, DEF CON that comes right after it are the things that you're going to see in the field in the next, if they haven't already started within the next couple of years as they become, you know, weaponized. So from an awareness standpoint, being able to understand, you know, how do these things work? What's the genesis of it? And then what are, you know, some of the products that are out there that might be able to help with the defense or mitigation of some of the risks associated with it. Um, I like seeing the, you know, the new stuff. And that's, you know, part of the reason why I come out here too is what's new because, you know, I'm sure you get this too, right? Is you need to be an expert on all products and that's very difficult to do. Um, it's more, 
more reasonable to have an awareness of what's out there and then bring that bring that knowledge back and try to apply it to the real world. Absolutely. And hopefully we can uh, take some of this and maybe some of the folks that you're meeting and ask them to be on the podcast at a later date. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sure we're working on already a couple of guests. We have our booking agents on it. <laughs> yes. And hey, if anyone's out there listening who would like to be on the podcast and you have an interesting angle on identity and access management or related technologies, uh, reach out to us. Um, Jeff, do you want to give that contact information? Yep. You can send it to questions at identity at the center.com. Um, or you can, you know, feel free to leave a voice uh, message that I'll be on the link in the show notes. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll get back to you and, and talk about, you know, how, to, how can we get you on and, and have a conversation that, um, you know, to make it something that, uh, we can all find interesting to listen to. Great. Yeah. So I think I'm going to call it here. It's the end of Black Hat. Uh, at least uh, in the next couple of hours, I'm heading back, trying to find a, a quiet place. who's just not working. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to head back to the conference here in a few minutes and see what else I can dig up. Um, yeah, real quick, just from a logistics standpoint, the, the conference is at what Mandalay Bay, which is at the in, in Las Vegas at the end of the strip, correct? Yep, totally in the south. So if people are thinking about going to it next year and assuming that it's in the same spot, like uh, any tips or, or tricks people should keep in mind? Yeah, book early. <laughs> Get a room at the Mandalay if you can. Um, Luxor is right next to it, and that's you know definitely within walking distance, and then so is Excalibur. All three are connected, so you don't actually have to go outside <laughs> if you don't want to. Um, right. But, you know, it's a certainly a longer walk, um, you know, depending on what you want to do. And then, you know, there's plenty of stuff to do in Vegas. But uh, I would say if, if you're at all interested in security and you haven't been to one, it's worth going to uh, just to kind of experience and see what it's like. And, uh, you know, take advantage of the different vendors. There are all kinds of events that are going on. Um, all the vendors want you at them. So, you know, there's parties at different types of clubs and different types of events and music things that happen throughout, throughout the week. Um, but, uh, it's interesting for sure. Uh, but book early because, you know, rooms go pretty quickly and, um, you want, you don't want to end up having to trek 30 miles in, uh, every day if you don't have to. Right. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to head back to the conference. Um, hope you guys uh, enjoyed listening to this show. Uh, I'm sure we'll get back to more identity focused and identity access management focused things in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but we thought this would be a good kind of timely recap of, you know, what I've seen with boots on the ground here at Black Hat. So we'll talk to you again, uh, hopefully next week. You've been listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. To access all episodes, visit identityatthecenter.com.